Hello, everyone. It's good to see you this afternoon. So um, we have my friend Carson here and I, and we're privileged to be here to t talk today about security operations. Very exciting topic for us. So as we get started, what I really wanted to highlight here is what we call security operations. It may sound basic, but it's important. Um, basically, it's really about the people, you know, the analysts that you have, the responders that you have, all of those people that are out there um, who are helping the SOC, um, the processes and data that they use, as well as the tools. So it's all of these things combined and collected together um, that are used to detect and respond to cybersecurity incidents. So um, what that means is that it's a really, really broad term. It could apply to one or two people who are doing incident response part-time, all the way up to you know, a big uh, center that has 100 people doing cyber threat intelligence and sophisticated correlations, as well as deception operations, so, and everything in between. And most of us have security operations that we're, are somewhere in the middle of that. So um, we believe that these strategies apply to any size SOC and really any operations that you have when you're doing cybersecurity. Um, this material that we're gonna go over is actually gonna be freely available. We're gonna hammer that home all afternoon here. We don't make money or anything. Um, I work for MITRE, and MITRE is about putting out you know, uh, information, data, standards, all of those things that might help the community. So this is a freely available set of references. We'll talk more about that at the end. So security operations, we're all grappling with all kinds of things, right? Whether you're small or large, we all deal with the same things. How many analysts do you need? How should it be structured? Do you have enough people to structure it? Should I just outsource the whole thing? If I have an incident, I'm just gonna call a service that helps me out. Um, <clears throat> staff attrition. I have these great staff members that I brought in, got familiar with my environment, and then they went and left on me. So how do I deal with that? Um, you know, how do I achieve the breadth and the depth of coverage of my sensors? Do I have my sensors in the right place? Um, how do I leverage my technology so that I am more effective? We have ops and engineering, that wonderful relationship about how do I get my engineering team to build out the tools that I need to be able to do what I'm gonna do. Plugging IT into cyber, you know, how do you do these, how do these things work together? Does the IT group work well with the cyber group? Um, all of these things. Cloud, now you have third parties involved. How, how do I get visibility into my cloud environments? How do I leverage incident response? And then how do I partner with the cloud providers to do incident response? How do I build a path to maturity? And then measuring success, finally. Do I, how do I know I'm doing a good job as a security operations center? So all of these things, and of course, the demand far exceeds the supply on our expertise. So we're all struggling with this stuff all the time, whether you're small or large. And Carson thought about this in 2014. And so what he decided to do is put together a compendium of information, almost a survey of what's out there in security operations, and bring together that information in a way that makes it easy for those people that are trying to get started in security operations and for leaders who are building security operations to be able to do um, what it is they need to do simply. So his original book was called 10 Strategies of a World-Class Cybersecurity Operations. I think I got that right. <laughs> anyway, fast forward to 2022, and here we are. So today we have Carson and I speaking, um, but I would be remiss not to uh, mention our third author, so Ingrid Parker, Intelligence Manager for Red Canary now. Um, the three of us came together and equally produced uh, material to update to the current version that we just um, released out in the last couple of months. Um, and that's 11 strategies for a cybersecurity, world-class cybersecurity operations center. Uh, this, is free. this is free. We'll provide links and all of this material came from it. So you don't have to worry about trying to take notes or anything like that right now. Um, let's see, what else? I guess what I would say too is this work uh, it comes from a lot of experiences. It's not just the three of us that provided um, to this, but 
There's also a lot of other people who are great experts in this field and have been doing it for a long time who also contributed. And all of that's in the, in the, the PDF version. Okay, so we didn't just update and add a strategy for this version. What we actually did was we re revamped it entirely. So we touched just about every word in it, right? You know, it was, <laughs> and it was a lot of back and forth. If you've ever seen three senior people working together, there's a lot of <laughs> spirited discussion about how to write something and what makes more sense and how to prioritize and organize it. And that was the three of us. We spent a lot of quality time together <laughs> and got to know each other quite well. Um, so I'm grateful to have my two co-authors um, to work with on this. Anyway, here are the 11 strategies that we came up with through all of this um, discussion. Um, we have, you know, if you group them up a little bit, they're about leadership, so what do you need to know as a leader? You know, what are the authorities? What kind of charter do you need to put together? Um, you know, what, what are the basics that you need to know? Which functions should you have for your security operations? You know, all of those kinds of things. And then we have your traditional technical kinds of um, considerations. So how do I do the coverage? Um, how does my uh, endpoint data response fit in with my network data response, fit in with you know, all of those other things? My cloud response stuff, how do all those things work together? Um, your traditional incident response. And then we get into things that are a little bit uh, more advanced. So communicating and measuring the performance. How do you um, get better at doing SOC stuff? And then finally, we provided a section on what are some of the more advanced things? So like doing deception. Deception is not something you generally want to start with if you're getting started in SOX. But it is something that very, very advanced folks, if you have the right kinds of people, can help you be a more effective um, organization responding. Okay? So for today, we thought about you all as an audience, and we thought you would be more interested in the intelligence aspects, the, the adversary things, uh, responding to these incidents, and then some strategies on how you do data and tools. So I'm going to start by talking about know what you're protecting and why, and then I'll talk about incident response and cyber threat intelligence. And then I'm going to hand it over to the great Carson here, and he'll continue talking about choosing the right data and then doing some tools. All right. I think I'm going to do that. There we go. <laughs> OK, so this strategy, know what you're protecting and why, this may sound very basic, but this is actually threaded through all the other strategies. If you can't do this well, you're, you're kind of uh, in trouble on all the other strategies. Um, and so what do we mean by that? Understand what mission you have. If you're running uh, an energy distribution company, you know, if you're doing electricity distribution, um, you're going to have a very different set of concerns and protections and monitoring things than you would if you were, say, a financial institution that's looking at credit cards. And so, you would use different strategies in figure, figuring out what detection you want, um, figuring out what your threats are. They're, they're different sets of things altogether. So this thing threads through all the other ones from my perspective, you know? Totally. So, I'm sorry, you're just standing there, so I thought I'd include you. <laughs> um, yeah, so there are five areas when it comes to, uh, you know, what you need to know about what you're protecting and why. So I, the, the technical and data environment, and back you know, decades ago, really that's what security operations focused on. When I was first starting out, we were truly focused on sensors, we were focused on where we're placing them, what do our networks look like, um, partitioning, those kinds of things. Today, we're, we're still focused on that, but it's a lot more complex. So we have to be choosy about how we configure things, otherwise you're gonna be overwhelmed in data. So, you know, back in the day, PCAP was awesome. <laughs> Today, PCAP can help a little bit, but you better have some other tools in your tool toolbox to be able to move your SOC forward, right? Which I believe Carson gets into a little bit here. Um, you also want to understand your legal and regulatory environment. So if you're an electrical grid, again, you have certain regulations, certain um, laws that you're going to have to maintain, and you, the SOC needs to be aware of these things. Um, if you're financial, you're going to look at some different kinds of legal implications. Um, and then users and behaviors and service interactions. 
So one of the things we've learned over time is this thing called non-person entities, or these services that are talking to other services. Um, we've evolved to where it's really important that you actually look at the security from service to service and how those are being authenticated. So there's these more sophisticated things that have uh, cropped up in security operations over the years. And then finally, the threats, which obviously vary based on your, um, your environment. Okay, so the more a SOC knows, the better. So now I'm gonna to shift to strategy five, which is about prioritizing incident response. So if you do nothing else well, do incident response well. <laughs> That's where you should start if you're getting started. Once you can do incident response, you can do a lot of the other functions that augment um, your environment and make things more sophisticated and help our responders. But responding to incidents is a hard thing to do well. And so what we suggest is that you anticipate the types of incidents that you're, that you're gonna have, plan for them, and prioritize them. So I used to support uh, a telecommunications company. And in that telecommunications company, they really believed that so they were providing services, network services. Their number one incident they wanted to avoid was a denial of service, you know, because they wanted to provide service and reliability, and they didn't want it to degrade. So a denial of service attack to them was horrible. Now, fast forward, I was helping, you know, and that was the same with the electrical se sector too. I've helped out some electrical folks and they really wanna keep the energy going as you all might expect. But now I've also worked for an engineering company, Miters and Engineering Company, for example. Their top priority is not gonna be a denial of service. It's gonna be more about, we don't want our intellectual property stolen before we're ready to release it. Um, so, you know, then you're talking about protecting certain kinds of uh, data and information, which is a very different kind of incident that when it's compromised than if a denial of service, right? So you really wanna know all these up front and plan for them and plan for how these response things happen and plan for who you're going to communicate with, right? So if you need to be able to not just talk within the SOC, but who are the stakeholders outside that will be impacted? Who are your business leaders that really need to know when something's going down? Okay, so the next thing I would recommend is that when an incident does happen, and it's the usual when, not if, when an incident happens, pause. And you really pause. Pause and figure out what's going on. So the biggest mistake I think that security operations folks make is they jump to acting. They go and they try to plug the hole. They see where you know, a machine's you know, beaconing out or whatever it's doing and they go and they take it offline. They rebuild the account and put it on. And guess what? They haven't really tackled the incident. So what we're recommending is that you pause and try to figure out the full scope of things. Figure out where else this adversary might be if it's an adversary within your environment. Figure out what else um, and keep asking that question. And when you're an operations manager, as I've been, <laughs> you're that person that's protecting your responders. So those responders, you know, the operations manager, you take all the heat from, from all the leaders saying, act, what do you mean? You haven't plugged it, what are you doing? You know? And so that your incident responders can figure out what's happening and try to get the bigger picture. So there's a real balance between the need to act and the need to know what's going on. And it is definitely more art than science. I mean, I can tell you the reverse, too. We were actually, on one incident, we were watching um, an adversary who was in, pretty sophisticated. We were having trouble. It was really subtle, and we were getting various indicators throughout our networks. And then suddenly, we lost 2,000 um, Social Security numbers of employees that were just he started heading out the door. And so that might have been waiting just a little bit too long. So you had to kind of figure out, okay, when do you act versus when you, do you... Uh, you know, just watch. And then finally, another thing that we don't tend to do is once an incident has ended, we end, we move to the next thing, and we don't really go back and do a hot wash and really look at what happened in that incident, what went right and what went wrong. So what we recommend you do is that you um, do a lessons learned, really take that time. That's how you're gonna get better at responding to the next incident, is when you take the time to really talk about 
what happened, what went right, what went wrong. Okay, that's that one. Okay, so my final um, strategy that I'm gonna be discussing is cyber threat intelligence. Okay, so I think uh, what I wanna highlight here is these three areas that have to really come together to do cyber, th in cyber threat intelligence well and be able to act on it. Um, there's a lot of times when we're seeing people buy these cyber threat intelligence feeds and when they purchase them, they don't do anything with them. So they've bought them and they're sitting there and they're coming in somewhere, but nobody's really using them. So that's not super useful. Um, the other thing we're seeing is that you buy these services, but they don't really apply to your environment or you haven't, you're not able to really you know, integrate them into your environment um, adequately. So um, anyway, we recommend you take a look at these three areas of information and from there decide um, what kind of threat information you, you need. So the first area is, of course, your technical environment. So what are the vulnerabilities? What kinds of endpoints do you have? Are you running a Microsoft environment? Are you running a Linux environment? You know, all the things that go into what does your technical environment actually look like? Um, does it have OT? You know, operational technology? Are you doing SCADA? You know, what are all those things? Um, the second one is, of course, the usual adversary information. So that's your threat stuff. So that's context. Who likes what you have? Who can use what you have? Your intellectual property or, you know, uh, what is important to you? What is also important to that adversary? So it's understanding the context of that adversary. And also, how do they normally act? Are they sophisticated? Do they have TTPs that you can find from other sources? You know, where are these adversaries coming from? Anything about the adversary, motives, that kind of stuff. The third area is relevancy. And this is the thing I think that sometimes we forget to look at. Is it really relevant to my environment? So again, back to that mission, back to strategy one. Knowing what you have, that's where we wanna look at, you know, is this threat really relevant to us? And so looking at your intellectual property and all of those things that go along with that. How sensitive is it? Do I care? Do I not care? Um, what can they do with the information? You know, all of those things. So, um, you know, that's, uh, we recommend the, the, the trisection of that, that space is where you get actionable threat information, being able to pull in threads and integrate it with your own data. One other thing I wanted to mention is that your data is the best threat data there is for you. <laughs> so if you have endpoint detection, if you have um, TTPs, you know, previous compromises, you have email atta attachments that are malicious, all of these things can play into great threat intelligence to find what else is going on in your environment. So start there, start with your, especially endpoint detection kinds of data, great place to start. And with that, I'm gonna hand it over to Carson to continue talking about data. Thanks a lot. All right, it's working great. All right, so in strategy seven, we want to select and collect the right data for you. Now, let me ask you all a question. When you ask an analyst, what data do they want? What do they say? All of it. And when you ask them how long to store it, how long do they say? Forever. Can you do that? No. So the issue is, where on this curve are you going to be? Because on the left-hand side of the curve, we're not collecting enough, we're not working to the, the strengths and capabilities and capacity of the tools that we have. Those, those big Vs, volume, velocity, veracity, all the wonderful Vs about big data. On the right-hand side, I would actually argue that your value goes back down to zero. When you have a giant pile of data and you don't have the sufficient capabilities to query it, it actually goes back down to zero. So you want to find that sweet spot, and that sweet spot's going to depend on what you're bringing to bear there and what your objectives are. A lot of people, when they talk about monitoring coverage and whatever monitoring makes you happy, they usually think about the breadth of coverage. And they're always saying, what a, we want to get to some percentage. What is that percentage? 100%, right? They always say 100%. Can we get to 100%? No. I would urge you to think about a different percentage that balances out the need to gain that breadth 
with the three other dimensions I show here, kill chain and attack coverage, the height of the computing stack, including your app layer coverage, and the types of systems and resources. Right? We're not just talking about Windows anymore. We're not just talking about EDR anymore. So think about um, bringing those to, to, together. Furthermore, we want to paint a complete picture for the analyst. And what that means is for every contextual source of data, we have something that's generating alerts to orient the analyst's attention to the threats of interest. And the, the reverse must also be true. We must also have contextual data to back up every alert sent to the analyst. Now I know you're thinking, duh, people get this wrong every day. I have been in contact with, even worked for organizations that did things like collect the data and then do nothing with it. And that is a very dangerous situation to be in because you are providing the illusion of monitoring when monitoring is not actually happening. And then when a red team shows up, or worse, the actual adversary, and there's no alerts, everyone gets really angry about you. And you're like, well, we were just collecting the data. So think about painting that complete picture. And as you can see here in this cartoon, we show some examples of what that might be for you. Understanding that volume of data left to right goes from petabytes to single alerts. And in strategy eight, we want to bring that data together in a way that makes sense for everyone in the Security Operations Center. From the folks who are doing triage to the folks who are doing hunting, investigation, response, engineering, whatever their function may be, TI, you name it, right? We can spend all of this money on all this tech, all this shiny tech. And in the olden days, in the on-prem days, SIM was actually one of the biggest victims of the following phenomenon. We need a thing. Let's go buy the thing. We bought the thing. It cost us $3 million. Nobody spends any time on the thing. In three years, when the uh, warranty or the maintenance contract is up, oh, we hate the thing. It stinks. Let's get rid of it. Buy the new thing. Right? Can we do that? Right? Of course not. So. We need to practice continual improvement over the lifetime of that tool. For every major investment your SOC has, you need to devote one or more analysts, either part-time or full-time, depending on how big you are, to championing that tool after the vendor leaves or after you've bought it, cloud or on-prem, doesn't matter. More important than that is you need to integrate those tools into one architecture. Folks, I'm here to tell you, single pane of glass does not exist. I'm sorry it doesn't. The SOC needs to work with a variety of capabilities that are put together in a coherent manner. And that picture and that integration and those data flows look different for different organizations. The first time I showed Catherine this chart, she said, oh, this is a multi-million dollar architecture. Not a lot of people can do that. And this is one of the debates we had, by the way. In the old on-prem days, that is absolutely universally true. I totally agree. In the cloud days, it's a little different, right? Different people have these things hooked up different ways. Some of these boxes don't even exist for you, and that's OK. But the important thing here is that you have some layer that the analysts start. For some of you, that's your SIM. Some of you don't have a SIM. That's a SOAR. Some of you don't care about either of those. It's your threat intelligence platform. And still others, it's your case management system. Don't necessarily expect the data to flow between all these tools. Instead, think about that pivoting experience from one tool to the other. People might love your EDR tool. Great. Do you really need all that data in your SIM, especially if your EDR has maybe a custom alert capability? Maybe you don't. Right? Some of the best analysts I've ever worked with are ones who spent most of their time outside their SIM. And by the way, folks, I've clocked thousands of hours sitting in front of SIM tools. All right? Some of the best analysts I've ever found were so good, not just because they were good at investigating, 
and they had all those analytic biases worked out of their minds and they were really objective. But because they found literally 50 other data lakes outside their sim that they used on a routine basis for detections and hunt in place, the days of expecting every single alert and every single security irrelevant data to go into the sim, or for that matter, one big data platform for the SOC are over. A good SOC is going to make choices about what data it brings into its own architecture. That might be SIM, that might be big data, that might be log analytics, whatever, log management, et cetera. <clears throat> we need to think about, are we using data in place? Are we bringing in, what's our strategy? Because it's usually a hybrid. So we want a set of engineers who are doing these integrations and thus empowering the members of the SOC to make improvements and all of these pieces on a routine basis. Going along with this, we want to think about what does that strategy look like in terms of my engagement with others? And this actually goes to one of the strategies we're not going to talk about as much today. Um, so I'm going, to, I'm going to conflate things a little bit here in just a second. I have worked in organizations that are completely closed. Think of them as giant black holes of data give us everything, we're a giant vacuum cleaner, and you'll never hear from us again. Does that work? No. On the opposite end of the spectrum, I've worked with organizations that had their SOC and their tools and everything in the same Windows Active Directory domain as the enterprise. Does that a good idea? Maybe not. You've got to find a balance that works for you and your risk profile. One of the key pieces is not just having that independent platform that maintains resiliency and trustworthiness during a major breach, and you will get breached, but also enables us to engage and democratize what we're doing in the SOC with others. Some of the best hunting and detection operations I've ever participated in or have observed is where the SOC deputized members from elsewhere in the enterprise, had them uh, uh, agree to a set of guidelines and guardrails for how they're going to engage. And they too were writing detections um, and doing proactive hunt shoulder to shoulder with the SOC. It was epic because they were bringing that business context to bear, but were playing by the SOC's rules in terms of how they handled the data and how they did um, escalations and investigations. Right? They weren't going off and being like, oh, we found a thing and, and circumvented the SOC. It was super, super cool. I encourage you to think about doing that, especially for stakeholders and service owners that are some of the neediest. Turn those people who are the most critical and needy to your greatest advocates. So think about having that architecture here that enables a balance of this. I digress. Let's talk about the book. So we wrote a book. It's 120 pages longer than the first edition. As Catherine mentioned, we agonized over almost every sentence in it, perhaps three times. It was good times. <laughs> um, it's free from MITRE. I don't make any money on it. Catherine doesn't make any money. Ingrid doesn't make any money on it, and neither does MITRE. You can get it from various online retailers, and that's at cost, all right? Um, so do whatever makes you happy in terms of getting a hold of this material, but we hope you enjoy it. With that, I'm going to uh, conclude with two quotes. The first one is from Through the Looking Glass. And this quote, you can read it on the screen, inspired the concept in evolutionary biology known as the Red Queen effect. Every organization, excuse me, organism in nature has to constantly adapt to its surroundings because they're always changing. Same is true of the SOC. I've worked with a number of organizations who are like, we're just gonna maintain the status quo, we're gonna maintain the platform, we're gonna maintain the baseline. You can't do that. Not anymore. You probably never could in the first place. So think about how are you enabling constant evolution in the SOC? And then the second one, which was very interesting, we heard it in the keynote this morning by William Gibson. The future has already arrived, it's just not evenly distributed yet. People often ask, what's the SOC of the future? The SOC of the future is now, but it's providing those capabilities to the entire constituency, the entire enterprise. So with that, I'm gonna conclude 
with 10 minutes left. I think we'd love to take some questions. Yeah, we'd love to take questions. Let's see, we got one right up here. And then I'll let you do it after that. <laughs> and I'm gonna go back, I'm gonna put the 11 strategies on the slide while we take questions. Yeah. Um, you mentioned that if you have an EDR, you may not need a SIM. Is that accurate? Maybe. Depends on what you're defending. Yeah. I've seen organizations who have a really cool EDR and they have a lot of endpoints and they, all of their other logs are in some log management solution that makes them happy. Maybe they've got some query on timer set of detections against it. Do they necessarily need a SIM? Maybe not. Yeah, and the answer there is not one size fits all. It's not a yes or no. It's a depends kind of answer, you know, your master's degree kind of answer. <laughs> kind of depends on your environment. Okay, thank you. Hi. Uh, first, are these slides available? Yes, I think. Okay. Yes. Yeah, the, I think the <laughs> and all the graphics you saw here, they're all straight from the book. Oh, yeah, great. the graphics yep. are available online. Um, I don't see anything in your 11 strategies about process automation, so I'm wondering if you can comment on that. About what, say that process, again? Process automation. Process automation. Yeah, that is one of our favorite topics. Actually, he's preparing another talk that has that. Um, you can automate some things, but not all things. Um, I think there's this, this idea that we can automate the world. In fact, we're doing that with artificial intelligence and other things. We think that we're gonna bring all this um, to bear and automate things. Um, we do talk a little bit about, um, was it breach as a, breach as a, um, breach as service, a service. Yep. In, in our chapter 11. Um, we talk about um, in the tools section, I think we go into a little bit. On yeah, I had about six or seven pages on SOAR. Yeah. Um, you know, there's a lot of ranting that could, could go on about automation in the SOC. I'll offer a couple thoughts. When we go and talk about automation, and I'm thinking back to the days when network IPS was a really big deal, we're all like, we're gonna shoot the cyber adversaries with lasers. We're gonna have sharks with lasers, and they're gonna go out and they're gonna shoot the adversary, and it's gonna be in sub-millisecond times, and we're gonna defeat everyone. Mm. Okay. One of the areas that I emphasize automation more is enabling the analyst to be more effective, more efficient, and more consistent yeah. in their investigations. Um, like Catherine was talking about in strategy five, you know, we can do a lot of planning around major um, incident types. I would also offer, you know, if we're gonna see 20 of the same kind of alert every day, dollars denote donuts you need to have a substantial amount of automation around the triage, enrichment, investigation, and response for that alert type. Yeah. Um, and whether you do that in a SOAR or not, eh, maybe, maybe not. Yeah, and to add automation, we're looking at, um, I, I'm, you know, we're looking at dynamic automation, dynamic defense automation, so how do you move as the adversary moves through your network automatically? Um, I think we're in the early stages of doing things like that, because you could create your own denial of service. So it's a double-edged sword. So if an adversary figures out that you've done this, um, they're gonna use it against you. So we're in the early stages of looking at how can we do smart dynamic defense. So that's another area, but I'd say that's more on the cutting edge than it is like mainstay today. Great question. Hi, how you doing? Um, do you all talk about ways to assess the maturity of an organization? So for example, you go to conferences, a lot of you know, sales on machine learning and leaders come back and like, we wanna do machine learning, do behavior-based analytics. <laughs> okay, great, we're not doing asset <laughs> discovery very well. <laughs> so is there, is there an approach that's addressed in the book or other resources, or can you just talk about how to assess the maturity of an organization so that you're right sizing the solutions? and not overwhelming them? Yes. Um, I have a few things to offer there. Um, the first is in strategy three. We actually uh, outlined 41 different potential functions of a SOC. And 
Uh, yeah, and they're 41, right? And no one, no one ever does everything. In fact, we strongly urge you not to do all 41. That would be bad. I don't care who you are. Um, there are different certain functions that are going to work for different organizations. To your point, if you're a three-person shop, as Catherine was discussing earlier, deception is probably in the, not the top of your priority list. In fact, I would probably urge you to not do that in a great measure. Um, so we provide a couple pathways to say, hey, if you're this size, you know, think about doing this, or if you're doing that, you know, then the, this next function is like the logical follow-on to that. Um, you know, when I speak with uh, some of my friends who are full-time uh, con independent consultants, um, they talk about judging um, socks in two ways. Um, one of them is using attack um, to measure both their detection investigative and response capabilities. Um, and the other way is using a tool like SOC CMM, uh, which has gone through several revisions um, since it, it first came up not, not that long ago. And you can go download that for free. I have no interest in that. I um, just know it exists. So I would start looking at those two things. What did I miss, Catherine? You missed chapter 10. I missed chapter 10. Yes, measuring performance to improve performance. I mean, that is right up there. And you know, how do you improve your SOC as you go along? Um, so we offer some things about how do you know if you're doing well? Um, certainly, you don't want to just count the number of incidents, because you, you know, there, there's certain um, strategies for doing statistics and that kind of stuff. Um, if you reduce the number of incidents, does that mean you got better at security operations, or does that mean you stopped monitoring the right things, right? So you have to kind of look at what you want to measure to improve it. That's what I would add. Thanks for saving me. Yeah, you, you covered it well. Covered it well. <sighs> Any more questions? I think we can, oh. Oh, there's one. Sure, yeah. I'm very attracted to your idea of just including SOC that you deputize people across the organization. How do you deal with the lack of security expertise that those people may have uh, in relation to the scope of your department? Great question. Yeah. Let me repeat the questions. The question was, is, um, uh, how do we deal with the lack of cyber expertise when we are deputizing folks outside the SOC um, to get more involved? Interesting question. So. Um, I want to actually hearken back to um, one of the examples that, that Catherine mo mentioned uh, or kind of motioned to several times, in particular IoT SCADA type situations where you've got people who have really deep understanding of the business and business you know, process automation and all the things that IoT touches from the, from the doors to the gas lines and everything in between, right? And oftentimes when we're coming up with really good detections, what it is is you get a detection V team together. And that is, has participants from usually in roughly three different shops. One of them is the people who run the platform that collect your security relevance data, perhaps the same, perhaps not. Two, the people who are writing the detections. And number three, those wonderful people who own those ICS SCADA systems, for example. And the conversation often goes around, OK, tell me about your business. Tell me about how your systems function. Tell me about what's important to you. And it will only take minutes for, that, for someone to realize, ah, oh, I've discovered a thing that should never happen. And I, as a security professional, know that's a risk. And that's where we learn from each other. Um, it is rare Ed, that uh, we, I've seen a situation where we have really good business-specific rules. Don't care who you are, whether you're running ICS SCADA or just ordinary IT or cloud or whatever, is when you get, you always have to get those folks together um, and they're, that are talking together. Yeah, and I'll add an example. So I, I put together a team of web developers and security experts because they tend to be different skill sets. Um, and I did it before an incident. We were trying to do scans and figure out why were websites vulnerable. So part of the answer is, you know, co-opt them in and deputize them before there's an incident. So they're already starting to get some familiarity. You, you got to pick certain people who are really interested in security. And there seems to always be someone interested in learning, right? So anyway, I put together this team of web developers and incident responders, put them together for a week to figure this out. Um, 
the web developers got more security uh, indoctrination, and the security people understood a little more about web developing. So that's kind of how you do it. You're mixing up multifunction teams. Other questions? I think we're done. I think we're done. All right, thanks for your time. Yeah, thank you.